Hello and welcome back to this Damnful Idealistic Crusade. This video is a review of the Blu-ray release from Region B by Eureka Entertainment of the 1954 Fox costume swashbuckler adaptation of Prince Valiant based on the legendary uh, comics by Hal Foster, which ran for decades and are legendary among the comic medium for their iconic artwork and just really being groundbreaking and ahead of their time. And they still remain fantastic adventures to read today. Unfortunately, that didn't necessarily translate to the film adaptation, which, while it does have a rather notable cast that includes Robert Wagner as Valiant himself, uh, Janet Lee, Deborah Paget, uh, James Mason, we even have uh, the uh, incomparably amazing Tom Conway pop up for uh, to, unfortunately too brief of, of an appearance, uh, but then uh, you've even got Sterling Hayden in there, which is probably the the you know an, an element that maybe. It sticks out a little bit because it's just a little strange hearing <laughs> and seeing uh, Sterling Hayden with his famously uh, sort of gruff tones uh, intonate a, a sort of uh, knight mentor character in, in a historical period film. But uh, it, it, it's definitely a film that certainly has um, a good number of elements that date it to the 1950s, uh, even some of the costuming, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but this is very much coming off the heels of the sort of reinvigorating and and real boom of period adventure films of the early to mid 1950s and specifically for costume adventure dramas swashbucklers and then getting also into the biblical epics because you had a sort of resurgence with MGM doing things like the King Solomon's Mines remake uh, then you had of course Colvatus which really got the ball rolling on the big historical epics and and the biblical epics and then MGM had a sort of secondary boom with the swashbuckler and Ivanhoe was released in 1952 and became extremely successful so MGM quickly followed up with two more Robert Taylor swashbuckling adventure films the second being Knights of the Round Table which is probably the best sort of comparison you can have with Prince Valiant because both were photographed in Cinemascope both have four track stereo mixes and amazing scores along with nice production value not to mention both actually are set in and around the round table and King Arthur and his knights and feature romance subplots and they're they're, they're very much cut from the same cloth and were made at the same time almost to cash in on this sort of resurgence of interest in the swashbuckler or the Arthurian legend type film which kind of went hand in hand with the resurgence of the biblical epic and the historical epic so this little period of time of the early to mid 50s where you had all these films coming out it's interesting to look at them and study them and see how each studio did it a bit differently and of course in 1953 fox would come out with the robe which was their big launch of cinemascope and then every fox film had to be in cinemascope and the more epic and scale it could be the better and prince valiant is of course in cinemascope mgm would make knights of the round table uh, borrowing the process and it was their first film in cinemascope so all of these are also early cinemascope films which means they are in the original 2.55 to 1 ratio and they have all the problems of early cinemascope lenses in terms of people having the infamous cinemascope mumps in terms of the facial distortions and how you can get sort of barrel distortions in uh, certain visuals and the last thing you could really do is actually pan the camera quickly because the entire image would start to distort uh, because all the early cinemascope lenses had defects in them so you had to shoot films differently and in some ways it's kind of like a minor version of what happened with the arrival of sound it did uh, sort of limit people in in how they had to actually work with the camera again uh, until they got used to it and then eventually Panavision made their better lenses and everybody else jumped over to that and Fox stuck with CinemaScope until 1967 because they were stubborn uh, so uh, but the other thing with this film in particular if you were to compare it to Knights of the Round Table, I think it's pretty obvious that Knights of the Round Table is the better and more entertaining film, which is surprising because Prince Valiant is credited to Dudley Nichols for the screenplay. 
And uh, Dudley Nichols is probably most famous for being John Ford's primary screenwriter. And he also wrote, you know, little films like Bringing Up Baby. So to associate him with uh, this film, which unfortunately is frequently quite dull and very episodic and which kind of fits that it was based on Hal Foster's comic, which of course was a was a strip comic, and of course itself naturally was episodic due to the actual design of the strip format. Um, you know, so it makes sense to that degree. But uh, when you read the original Prince Valiant comics, which I've read some of over the years and little bits, and I have uh, this this reprint of some old strips that was done for Free Comic Book Day, um, they still are are fun to read and engaging, and they're all about about adventure and chivalry and it becomes very apparent why uh, these were such breakthroughs in terms of the artwork but it also is very apparent what appeal they have because it it's it's really timeless in terms of the storytelling um, you could still make a great Prince Valiant film today uh, you know as long as you actually worked out a good story to tell over a feature film which this really doesn't do so Unfortunately, this film really does drag, and it was directed by Henry Hathaway, who actually did express and was quoted that he had no desire to make this film, and the quote, if you actually on the Wikipedia page for the film, it literally says, you know, the, the quote is, I had no desire to make this film, but it is a favor for Zanuck, and it shows in the film. <laughs> like, well, yeah, when the director says that, you know, I, I think that kind of explains a lot. Um, the, the main cast does pretty well and there are some good action set pieces and we do build to at least several nice sort of climactic moments that have uh, at least a good amount of, of bigger staging and stakes and things that would befit a, a bigger cinemascope period swashbuckler film but you know it's it never reaches the um, the excitement or investment that you get in, say, the MGM films. And while I don't think either Ivanhoe or Knights of the Round Table are perfect, and I think Robert Taylor is maybe a little bit, obviously, stoic in, in, in his uh, lead performances, trying to ostensibly play a more dashing, heroic character like Ivanhoe, um, he's still good in those roles and they're sort of tailored for for his screen image well here in prince valiant you've got robert wagner in the lead role and this was relatively early for him and he was a contract player and he does at least have some youthful energy but because the script is so episodic and the pacing is so dulled he, he doesn't seem very effective and unfortunately he just kind of seems lost and it's not helped by the fact that they put this wig on him that it looks rather comical <laughs> And you can't help but notice it in every scene of the film when, you know, your lead character has this rather amusingly goofy looking wig on. And, you know, it's supposedly trying to emulate the look of Prince Valiant from the original comics, but... Um, it didn't look like that in the comics that I've read. Um, so I, I think that was that was definitely a mistake because it's just, I think it's one of the most obvious wigs in all of film history because you just can't stop looking at it the whole time. Um, another note about the costuming, um, there there are... Several elements that do creep in that are that are not period. Um, they do they do a relatively good job at getting the period look and feel, and it's Fox putting some actual money into an early Cinemascope film, so you do get some nice visuals. And the film was actually shot by Lucian Ballard, as most of the early scope films had to be shot by a great cameraman to actually work around the inherent problems and getting used to Cinemascope. And the last thing you'd want on a big budget historical film in scope would be to have a bad cameraman. However, you can definitely tell that this is Fox versus what MGM put into theirs, and since they were shooting their historical films in the UK to get more money out of, um, in, in terms, get more value for their money because the dollar went further in the UK at the time, and they were using British uh, locations and British craftsmen. And they also had Freddie Young shooting <laughs> these films. So you can't, com it's not fair to compare these films, really. I mean, they're, they're linked in a lot of ways, but I mean, the deck is so stacked uh, against this because um, 
this is Freddie Young working in scope. And yes, Lucian Ballard is a legendary cameraman, but it, it's also, you know, done at Fox on, you know, a decent budget, but it's still not the greatest. And they didn't put as much into the costuming, which is noticeable, especially when you have uh, Janet Lee and Deborah Paget throughout the film who play sisters, who both have their own romantic interests and that sort of gets squandered and mixed up over the film. And that's the sort of romantic subplot. Um, but they're frequently shown Known to be in sort of you know, Arthurian looking gowns that are, of course, v very brightly colored, almost as if they're like maybe they were being more costumed to be extras in a Disney feature rather than a film. Uh, but they, they are at least trying to get some of that, um, that iconic usage of color that goes back to Adventures of Robin Hood, but it was really Ivanhoe that pushed that for the 50s. So again, it's another sign of Fox trying to match that. Just like Robert Wagner's unfortunate wig in this film, uh, it, it's very obvious that they didn't worry about period undergarments for, for all of the actresses because uh, they, they have very... Um, very pointedly obvious uh, the, the the sort of um, uh, torpedo style undergarments um, do uh, obviously protrude from the uh, supposedly period gowns and it's quite obvious and very 1950s um, you see that happen in a lot of 50s films obviously but it's it's really kind of amusing when you see it in a period film and it's it's, it's just about the most not period thing you could have in terms of costuming so that's the other sort of little amusing note uh, along with the rather unfortunate wig that uh, poor Prince Valiant is stuck with the whole film. Uh, again, as I alluded to, we do have a fantastic cast and they of course give James Mason the rather... Uh, uniquely James Mason type role of the very charming, very elusive uh, figure who's higher up in the round table and in Arthur's court, who is, of course, very obviously also the secret villain of the piece. And he plays everything well, but it doesn't seem much of a stretch for him. So, you know, and then you have Sterling Hayden as the mentor sort of character to Valiant who starts training him as a knight. And he's He's basically playing a, a very sort of larger-than-life, gruff-type mentor character. Again, it's just a little bizarre <laughs> just to imagine Sterling Hayden wielding a broadsword and, and wearing chainmail and having his famous voice come out. You know, it's just... It's, it's still a little weird for me every time I see this film and, and, and I have to get used to it again. But, um, you know, he, everyone in the cast does well. My only real issue with the casting is they have the forever underrated and underutilized Tom Conway uh, and really just a bit part. He's basically the sort of underling who follows Arthur around and has like one passing line. Um, of course, his, his health was not the greatest in, in the last stages of his career, but it's just super painful to see him pop up and then just not get to do anything and uh, it just is a terrible waste that that that's all he has to do in this film because if he had had some actual you know lines of dialogue it would have at least enlivened things and made this giant Tom Conway fan much happier um, but at least he did get to appear in a big budget major Fox release. The big takeaway from this film, however, is not the visuals, not the attempt at pageantry, not the attempt to uh, one-up uh, MGM doing these historical adventure swashbuckler films. Uh, like Knights of the Round Table, the greatest element is the film's score. This has an absolutely incredible score by Franz Waxman, so that is the primary reason you should see this film. It is a phenomenal score. Uh, Knights of the Round Table also has a beautiful score. So most of these films, which are frequently never discussed and very much underrated, even though uh, Prince Valiant here, I think, is one of the weakest of, of this example of a sort of mini genre in the early to mid 50s. Uh, there are still a lot of things going for it, and a most of these films do have really exceptional scores, and the scores have to do a lot of heavy lifting. Well, the score in this film does all the lifting. <laughs> You know, uh, because unfortunately, the you know you have a director who doesn't want to make the film. You have it being an early CinemaScope film, and they're trying to put all this high production gloss on it, or at least as much as Fox would a lot for it at that time. Following up to the robe, you have it being based on a very famous iconic comic property, uh, but 
it's the score that carries everything. Uh, the, the score is the lifeblood of the film, and when there's no score, uh, the film frequently just kind of just stops dead. And so that also plays into the issue with the script just feeling so episodic. Uh, so it's a film that does feel quite a bit longer than it actually is, um, and I just wish that the overall that the overall story was better integrated and that there was a sense of pacing to it and uh, that it had been directed by an actual director who wanted to do it. Um, that would have made a giant difference, <laughs> but unfortunately it wasn't to be. And I know I sound like I'm being very harsh on this, but I did, I did enjoy seeing the film and actually being able to see it in widescreen. This is a film that would be absolutely murdered by pan and scan, but it's also one of those films that's very much and very obviously an artifact of the time in which it was made in terms of it being early cinemascope, part of this sort of early 1950s interest in doing historical films. And it gets mixed up uh, amongst all of the better known titles because mostly you're just going to hear about, uh, I mean, you'll hear about The Robe a little bit being the first CinemaScope film. You'll you'll hear obviously about Ben-Hur at the end of the decade. Maybe you'll hear some about Quo Vadis because most people don't realize how important that film is and it's actually quite underrated. Um, but you know, you're certainly not going to hear about Knights of the Round Table or Prince Valiant in the same way you will about Ivanhoe, because that deservedly does have a reputation because it's sort of jump started this interest in making period historical action adventure films and sort of a mini swashbuckler resurgence, which we hadn't seen for quite a number of years since the the sort of thinning out or, or, or tailing off of, um, of swashbucklers in the 30s and early 40s. So I, I think these films are fascinating for a lot of different reasons, but when you look at Prince Valiant, you're, you're very much going to be able to tell that it's a film of limited qualities that is very much a Fox product because it has a lot of Fox-isms, if you will. It's early CinemaScope. It has four-track stereo. It was shot on the Fox lot, so you don't have the benefit of the MGM films shooting them in the UK and getting all that wonderful production value for very cheap. Um, so it is very much in keeping with what you'll see in all of the attempts at Fox early CinemaScope films to do something bigger and to have some spectacle for scope. And you know, it, it looks and sounds very much like what you'd see in any Fox scope 1950s period film. Now we turn to the disc release and the uh, technical aspects of this transfer. This is a film that Fox hasn't done a lot with. I, I believe it got a DVD here back in, I think, 2004. And, you know, that, that that's really been about it. Uh, it. They did not release a Blu-ray here. It's just been other countries that released seemingly what is an old Fox Master and probably the one they struck for that DVD in 2004. So the best of those is the Eureka Region B release, which is a film-only release, so it is not a special edition. And it's good that it sold at a lower purchase price because... The master on here is very old and very, very compromised. I have not seen that Fox DVD, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same because this seems like a, an old DVD era master. However, it is extraordinarily compromised in ways that you don't normally see, um, even for a film of, of this type from this era. And what I mean by that is this is not restored. This is not... Um, this is not a, a, a studio master that was struck from a, a, a good quality source that didn't have a lot of imperfections baked into it. This master has tons of imperfections baked into it, and that becomes rather plainly obvious from the opening sequence alone. So what we have here is a single layer BD-25 of uh, you know, obviously a much older Fox HD master, seemingly done in the DVD era. Um, obviously now in 1080p, but the the source they they used, I, I don't know. It's obviously not the original camera negative, and I certainly hope it wouldn't be because the biggest issue you're going to notice is while most of the feature looks pretty solid for an older HD scan, any time there's an optical, which means every dissolve, every um, every bit of dupe footage for scene transitions, basically any sort of effects processing 
is not from the same source. And not only that, it's lesser quality and degraded, and most of them have faded color. So that means you will literally have shots end, and you have the sort of normal, typical scene transition, which usually will be of lesser quality. So eagle-eyed viewers will notice that, and you have to sort of wait for the little visual pop of the next shot to finally click in back to uh, you know negative or um, higher quality materials from the optical transition. Here you get that in its most extreme and obvious because the majority of all of the transitions and opticals and uh, lesser dupe footage is so degraded that you will literally have a shot start to end and the actual transition is faded if not a bit pinkish in some places because it has color fading and the quality is so uh, so much lesser that uh, you really notice those transitions being bad and then it re really is noticeable when it clicks back in to the next shot uh, obviously back to the, the quality source so this is a transfer where all of the dupe material is of lesser quality and it's throughout the whole film if that wasn't enough you will see bits of damage specks scratches small little marks here and there that sort of are sprinkled throughout the whole transfer so this was not a pristine element to start with there are also one or two examples where you'll actually see a brown line in the image that happens a couple different times um, not not terribly so but it is definitely noticeable uh, there's also a bit of frame wobble here and there even in the opening credits uh, so there there are you know significant issues with the element they were transferring and this was not meant to be a, a restored version nor did they even seem to attempt that so this is very much an as-is presentation of an old fox master that at least was done in hd so again i'm sure this is probably what they made to then uh, bounce down to 480p for that uh, dvd in 2004 but they had a extremely compromised source they were working with and while it cleans up pretty well and looks you know even pretty decent upscale to 4k uh, when you upscale this to 4k who boy are the issues <laughs> noticeable because you're, you're putting an extra magnifying glass on them so this is not a new master by any stretch of the word i don't know when exactly what this was made i don't know what the source was but you cannot not see the pretty glaring problems here um, so much so that it's actually quite surprising how good the overall transfer looks for the most part. Uh, you know, it is obviously a dated master, but um, when you aren't specifically having to look at all those issues and, and the fact that this is early scope and most of the shots are very static, you know, it does actually clean up pretty well. So it makes sense why Eureka realized they could make at least a pretty solid Blu-ray of this and get something out there for this film in HD. So I do applaud them for that, but they are working from an extremely old and compromised Foxmaster. And this film needs a brand new scan stat. I mean, this is, uh, you know, it, it's really notable that whatever this element is has some pretty big problems. Now, the audio is lossless stereo, and it actually is a matrixed version of the original four track stereo. So you're getting the original full proper cinemascope four track mag stereo mix from the premiere engagements which of course makes Franz Waxman's score sound majestic and huge uh, you also even have the uh, panning dialogue across the front channels that was commonplace at the time and unfortunately is a as a practice that isn't seen as accurate today so a lot of films get that remixed out uh, rather stupidly because people don't realize that that was an art form and films were designed to have uh, panning voices across the front stage uh, that is still here it's there's not a whole lot of it but you will notice it throughout so this is a track that you will have to manually matrix yourself on your receiver it is not flagged for it uh, but it is actually four channels matrixed it is not a flat stereo track as some reviews would claim uh, so it, it's rare that you do get the full four channel experience preserved on any cinemascope released on home video so it's great when it happens it would be better if this was a new transfer and actually discrete 4.0 or maybe up mix to 5.1 if they would insist on it but at least it is preserved here and this is a matrix stereo track which you can decode out into the original four channel form unfortunately though the problems i talked about with the picture 
they also have uh, pop up here because there are some massive problems with the audio. There is quite a bit of hiss that is quite frequent in the surround channel because as a mono surround, uh, there are some dropouts, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't seem like this was hit with uh, any sort of major noise reduction, thankfully. So it does sound really good at its best points. But there are also moments where there is some really unfortunate high-pitched frequency whines that happen at different points. And uh, that does pop up a number of times. So you will notice that if you have a discerning ear or a really good uh, a sound system. Uh, there's also some bits of buzzing and hum and, again, uh, sort of bursts of... Of, of hiss that do uh, unfortunately remain rather constant. So this is a beautiful sounding score and it's a CinemaScope four track stereo mix with panning dialogue. So it really should be properly preserved and transferred accurately in an archival way. Um, listening to this track really makes you wish that that had happened because it does sound quite good for an early scope film and it's really a, a treat to have a four track uh, mix preserved and be able to listen to it at home even if it's just a matrix stereo it sounds great except for the problems I'm discussing in terms of the source they transferred and the things that they didn't address so this is really an unrestored audio track as well. I mean, I'm sure they had to clean it up a little to get it transferred when they made this master, but there are some really glaring problems with the audio track as well, and that goes into even some bits of distortion. So this is a track that will uh, both please and infuriate uh, fans of classic film sound and especially multi-channel sound of the 50s and, and cinemascope films. So if, if you know anything about film sound of this era, you'll know that they were trying to break new ground. They were still technically limited in some ways, so you will expect, you know, some thinness to the dialogue and some occasional harshness and, uh, you know, very little to infrequent surround usage except for mostly the score. There's, there's a few little little uh, bits of surround usage for some effects and things. It's really only a couple things like when a guard falls from a high tower, there's, there's a nice little effect or two, but it's mostly reserved for just carrying the ambience of the score. Um, but it's, it's just really frustrating because this could be a beautiful transfer of, of this mix, but unfortunately it has as many problems as the picture does. So overall, this is a really frustrating master because the source they were working with is so compromised and they didn't seem to really bother with trying to clean anything or, or work on it. So this is a very old uh, Fox master uh, done probably in the early 2000s. And this is very much as is. So I'm amazed this looks and sounds as good as it does for most of the film. And it's really a shame because if it was done properly with a modern scan and transfer and an archival setup, um, this, this could look and sound really good and it would help you enjoy the film more to not have you know constant dropouts on the left channel and high-pitched whine and buzzing and uh, hiss bursts and uh, faded color opticals and, and frame wobble and hairs in the gate and speckles and damage throughout and some color fading. So uh, unfortunately, this is a very rough presentation and this is really the only option you have for seeing the film. So it's not necessarily going to help its reputation overall. Now, unfortunately for the extras, all you really get are the trailer for the film, and that's it. Uh, the trailer does look pretty good, but it obviously does have some color fading, uh, so it gives you an idea of what a, more of a faded print might look like of Prince Valiant, and it does have uh, mono audio, so you get to hear what some of the sound of the film sounds like folded down to mono. Overall, um, this is a nice solid release from Eureka of a, a really lesser Foxmaster. We do at least get a really nice reproduction of original poster art, which is very colorful and looks nice. Unfortunately, they've got Janet Lee on the cover, and it makes it look like she gets to do a lot in the film. And unfortunately, she's just kind of there. They don't really give her anything to do other than look fantastic and look worried. Um, Deborah Paget gets is the same problem. So unfortunately, both lead actresses don't really get to do much in the film, which is also another sort of mark against it. Um, we do have at least some nice interior art, which I'll pop the disc out. 
because you actually get to see an image of Valiant standing inside the round table, being essentially judged by King Arthur and the knights. And then the rear looks pretty nice, but you can tell this is one of Eureka's earlier, basically film-only discs, so it's not part of their Masters of Cinema series or anything. But at least it is getting this film out there on Blu-ray. And as I said, uh, the film has been released in a number of European countries, seemingly from the same master. And this is probably the one to go with because it's very easily available, usually rather inexpensive. This is also region free, so you can actually play this on a US player. This is just an, an essential uh, region B title pickup. Uh, that's really the only good or solid release of this film. If you're at all curious about this, or you, if you really like uh, 50s period historical adventure swashbuckler or historical epics at all, uh, this will definitely uh, be right up your alley, although I do consider it one of the unfortunately lesser of, of that sort of mini genre or, or 50s genre really because it's it's really not mini it was it was quite substantial at the time um, so it, it has a lot of the the trappings of both Fox films at that time and also films of this sort of resurgence of both the historical film and the swashbuckler so there are great elements to recommend and enjoy in this and it is very much a product of its time I don't think it lives up to the original comic on which it is based but at least the intent was there you just wish the overall film was better and more effective at doing that and bringing the comic to life. However, if there is one reason to watch this film above anything else, it is Franz Waxman's incredible score, which is absolutely phenomenal. So those are my thoughts on Prince Valiant on the Eureka Region B Blu-ray release, which remains the only decent version that you can get and really the, your best option for getting a physical media release of this film. I don't fault Eureka for releasing this. None of the issues are on them. It's all baked into this Fox Master, and Fox couldn't even be bothered to release this on Blu-ray in the U.S., and had they done so, it probably would have just been film only, maybe with the trailer, just like what we have here. So, again, this isn't eureka doing anything at least they put the film out and it's a budget release from them so uh, you know obviously it, it that does kind of help make up for the fact that the transfer quality is so compromised due to the compromises in the source master that fox made uh, fox really should have redone this and it still needs to be properly scanned and preserved in both picture and sound because these films are quite important for their place in history and also the larger than life aspects and this also being an early cinemascope film with its four track stereo mix surviving uh, this would make a rather impressive uhd title even though i don't think it's it's quite up to the same level as other films of its genre at the time it still has production values that you'll never see in a film again in 2023 and it has such a beautiful score and you know some nice visuals and i think early scope films should be seen in the best quality possible um, that you could make a, a pretty handsome looking 4k uhd release of this um, you, you probably wouldn't get a, a lot of heavy sales because i don't think there's a lot of people out there clamoring for for the fox film version of prince valiant but you know if if you were to give them the option and properly market it you know who knows but uh, these films do need proper preservation and seeing an example like this of an extremely compromised old HD master with uh, a lot of damage baked in to both the picture and sound even having constant bits of faded color throughout the image and other damage and uh, it's just quite unfortunate so um, this release is as good as it can be from this dated source and if you're interested in this film the Eureka is really the only choice you have and it's usually so cheap or you can import it for very cheap that I do highly recommend it uh, for anyone interested in early scope films or who love historical 50s films or if anything I've described sounds at all interesting uh, this is a nice release you can pick up for very cheap but just be aware the actual quality is very limited because Fox's source master is extremely compromised. So as always, I hope you've enjoyed my babblings about films, film history, film culture, uh, adventure films of the 50s and physical media releases uh, please do keep supporting both studio and boutique labels by buying films on disc even if it's a compromised master that's the best version available because 
you know, it, it at least shows there's interest in these films, and maybe we can somehow convince Fox locked away in the Disney vault to, you know, maybe start or have Disney start working on some of the uh, bigger scale Fox films to actually properly save and preserve them. Uh, I know that's easier said than done, but, you know, wishful thinking. Um, so as always, uh, please do keep your discs spinning to help keep both physical media and film culture alive. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Darn, they're out of wigs. Well, um, can I can I get the Prince Valiant wig? I have no shame.